of it. Hi, uh, this is Phil Klein, and this is the TEDx Organizers Hangout, uh, focusing on how to get your TED talk on TED.com, your TEDx events talks. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about curation, and we have uh, Emily McManus, the editor for uh, TED.com, here with us. But first, we're going to introduce a number of the um, TEDx organizers who are here. Um, maybe you could just say a little bit uh, about your, yourself, your event, um, uh, and, and if you have a specific topic area, if you could briefly mention that, that would be fine, too. Uh, Emily, anything else we need to ask people to do when they introduce themselves? Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Okay, all right, cool. Gordon, uh, you want to go ahead and start us off? Sure. My name is Gordon Garb, and I'm the creator of TEDx Sunnyvale here in Silicon Valley in the San Francisco Bay Area. Welcome. Uh, Haley? Haley, you want to go ahead next? Oh. Can you come put it in? Oh, there's Haley. Haley, can you introduce yourself? What, are you, what event are you with? I think her connection may be sketchy. We'll come back to you. Uh, ha Javier, can you say hello and tell us what event you're with? If you're on mute, you might need to unmute. Ah, hello there. I, I didn't know why you're good on the mute. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm Javier. I'm from Argentina. Uh, my, my event is Telex Rosario, but uh, I've been involved with uh, uh, three other events. And, uh, well, we've done three from Rosario. We always do around 14 talks each time from very broad spectrum of topics. Uh, I want to. I heard Emily uh, uh, at TED uh, on the free oh. free event uh, on. tour. <laughs> uh, well, but I want to hear some more. <laughs> We've got more. Uh, Jenny, can you introduce yourself real quick? Hi, I'm Jenny Casey. I uh, organize TEDx Orlando with my husband Dave, who's not here right now. Um, we're working on our fourth event um, now, so we've, we've done three so far. Um, no talks on TED.com yet, though. All right, welcome. And if you could keep your mic on mute when you're not speaking, that helps us all to hear since there's so many of us. Uh, Kara, could you introduce yourself? Hey, guys. Kara DeFrius. I organize TEDx Into It, and I'm also involved with TEDx San Diego. Okay. Welcome. Uh, Noha, can you introduce yourself and where you're from? Okay. Okay. Hey guys, I'm Noha from Egypt. I organize TEDx Tanta, TEDx TBSS, and TEDx Shmukum. Okay. Welcome from Egypt, Noha. And if you could speak up a little bit louder when you speak, it will help us hear you better. Uh, Pablo? Okay. You might be on mute. I'm back. Okay, Pablo, we don't hear you. Uh, Haley, you want to go Haley. ahead and, and... Yeah, sure, that'd be great. Um, I've connected the Ethernet cable, so maybe I won't keep getting kicked off. That's better. Yeah. So, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so Haley Foster, uh, TEDx NASA, and uh, missionary for TEDx everywhere. I consult all over the country for anybody who asks me, and I do speaker coaching, and TEDx has taken over my life. <laughs> wow, yeah, it'll do that, won't it? Uh, yeah. Okay, well, I'm Phil Klein, and I'm with uh, TEDx Rainier in Seattle. Uh, I've held three events, um, really interested in this conversation. So um, why don't I just let uh, Emily take over. If you want to just share a little bit about some general uh, thoughts and ideas that you have uh, for us and kind of set the stage for conversation, and if there are questions you want us to focus on or... Maybe you could just tell us a little about what's on your mind. For sure. Um, so I guess to start, um, I think some of you, I know Phil and a couple of you, um, came to my talk in Long Beach um, on the Monday. And for those of you who didn't, um, I know, Gordon, you were working. Um, but for those of you who didn't, um, the basic theme is that I love posting TEDx talks on the homepage of TED.com. 
Like it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, it means so much to me to be able to pull something from an event um, that one of you guys puts on and share it out with the world. And um, so I've been thinking a lot with my team, with David Weber and some of the other people on the team, um, just about how to how to get that to happen more often. Um, and it happens a lot. Um, I have stats from a month ago. We have 246 TEDx talks right now on the site out of 1,500 talks. It's a nice proportion. Um, and it's only going up, of course, um, as your events get better and better, as you know, we get more and more excited about what you guys are putting out there. Um, but I had my team get together and think of some ways to, um, some things that we would love to tell organizers um, to make a TEDx talk especially um, not only work in the room, which is the whole point of having a TEDx. Bring your community get together, you know, have a wonderful conversation, but um, to have that sort of extra little side benefit of getting on the homepage of TED.com, just a couple things um, that you can do if you decide to. Um, and then we've came up with um, 36 reasons that we've rejected particular talks for the homepage. Um, and so, and I didn't get to show that in my talk in Long Beach because I didn't have a um, slide screen, which is probably better for all of us. Um, so, as a start, and I don't know if I want to go, you know, if we want to go over all of these reasons in our chat or, um, you know, however we want to do it, but um, I did send Phil a link to those slides with all the reasons. Okay, I'll um, go look that up now. Cool, yeah, it's in an email. And, um, but what I want to talk about while I have you guys all online is, is just those small things, um, those little things that you can do, um, the, the sort of, especially the sort of very low-hanging fruit reasons why a talk wouldn't necessarily make it, um, even though it's wonderful and smart and well curated. Um, and so if, if that is interesting, I can sort of go into that stuff, and then I'd really love to hear about your own experiences of talks that you thought would be, like, just about there um, and then didn't get chosen for one reason or another. Um, and talk a little bit, you know, and, and be fairly honest with each other about why you think that might have happened, what you do differently ne next time. Um, everything that I hear from you guys, I can sort of then feed back into the community when more people ask. Um, so I'm really, really interested in, in talking. Um, with you guys, not just in talking, I'm talking <laughs> at you guys, I guess. Um, so, I don't know, I mean, Phil, you've had some talks picked up um, from your events at, in, in the past. Um, now, were, were you, uh, was Leslie Hazelton at your event? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, or do you just want to sort of ask what the experience is like, or, or? I guess, yeah. I mean, Leslie Hazelton's an interesting story because now she's speaking at TED Global uh, 2013 coming up. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting talk. It's a global talk about the Quran, and this was a talk in 2010. And the basic um, experience was that her talk went viral when we posted it online. So there were a few things that were factors there. One was she's a journalist. One, another is that her theme is global, and, you know, this idea of us as, let's say, non-Muslims having a, uh, a good understanding of Muhammad, an understanding of the Islamic faith, just is a, a new idea to many people. So it was the right idea at the right time for a lot of people, and expressed by someone who was an agnostic Jew, Leslie Hazelton. So, and her presentation style is pretty outstanding, and she has this wonderful English accent, you know, so, um, but I literally saw her talk go from country to country and the commentary go from country to country before we even got to, you know, having it submitted for TED.com. So it was an interesting talk in that respect. Um, as far as once it got on TED.com, yes, it opened up a huge new audience, was much larger. 
Um, the most recent experience we had like this was with uh, a, a very different talk, which was Leslie Morgan Steiner's talk on uh, domestic violence, which got on TED.com like a couple months ago. <laughs> and it's a very intense, emotional talk. Um, and, you know, like one that brings up a lot of, of challenging feelings for people. Uh, you know, but uh, so, so those, are, those are two experiences that, that we had with that. Um, I don't know. I'll just say that I feel like there's a huge cliff between a talk that gets on TED.com in terms of viewership and anything else, right? I mean, it feels like there's so little we can do other than pray and hope and, you know, maybe one day and if all the stars are aligned, it seems like, you know, we can do every, a lot of stuff we can do as organizers in preparation, but it's limited, right? I mean, we can, we can do good production values, we can do speaker prep, we can you know, try and make sure the message is globally resonating and universal. And, um, you know, and then there's sort of like, who knows what's going to happen on the day of the event. Um, it does seem like it's a little mystifying, the process of selection that, that happens. It seems like what seems to be in vogue seems to change from year to year. Um, uh, I really appreciated, uh, you know, all the insight that you give and having kind of regular updates to that. I thought that your, you know, your sharing during the TED uh, session, the session at TED Long Beach for TEDx organizers was particularly good in the sense that it focused us on, in new directions, but with, you know, a long-term thing. Specifically, you were saying really think of the audience. And that was a new approach. I mean, obviously, we thought of the audience, but as the purpose of the talk is really about the audience getting a new idea, was was an insight. So, if you could maybe elaborate on that a little bit more, and on how your thinking is evolving as we now have over fifteen hundred talks on TED.com, what you're looking for isn't so much the you know the groundbreaking talk in a new area because there probably are already two or three talks in that subject area. So how is your sense changing or evolving? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, thanks for the setup. Um, yeah, the the audience focusedness, um, you know, and I I think I at Long Beach I'd called it structured for listening, and then somebody was like, but what about you know, viewing? Um, but the idea that sorry um, that there's there's an aspect of booking a speaker beyond you know making sure that they're the right speaker at the right time and the right speaker for your community and your stage um, which is to listen to their talk and just figure out if you like it um, you know just very basically you know are you sold on this person when they give their talk and it's sometimes hard because you know you might really like the speaker as a person you might like them as an abstract you might be like, I, I need to have a science on my, on my program and this is my science. Um, but listening to that talk, reading the draft, working with a speaker, and really treating yourself and your team as the audience. Um, and it's funny because it seems really basic when I say it, but it's something that I don't see a lot of co other conferences do. A lot of other conferences stack the speaker lineup, um, put butts in seats and that's sort of it. Um, and one of the things that I see my coworkers when they're doing the Big Ted do is just listen, listen, listen to those speakers and push them um, and ask them not just to give the talk that they came to give but to give a TED talk. Um, you know, because they're, that's why they decided to come and speak for you is, you know, they know what a TED talk is and they want to give it. Um, but not a lot of people can do that without help. Uh, so I can do your slides now if you want me to do your slides on the focus as part of this activity. Um, yeah, and, and actually let me let me quickly um, pull the room as well. Um, on other things that you think you've done, whether or not the talk made it to TED.com, other things that you've done with a speaker to take them from good to great. Um, we can just hang on that slide for a while because I love 
love posting TEDx talks on TED.com. Um, but does does that does anyone in the in the chat room? Yes, Haley. Hi there. Good to see you. Um, well, I work with a great deal of professional speakers, um, and they're not my favorite uh, TED. Ex participants because they're very difficult to coach. Um, but the way that I've conceptualized it for them is to, and I always start with their passion. I always start with their true passion. What makes you get up in the morning? That's what I want to, I don't care if it's golf. I want to know who you really are. Is it your grandchildren? Is it that you can't wait to get to work? You know, whatever it is. I need to know that because it informs the way I help to coach the talk. And, um, and then we go to their expertise. And we talk all about We may have lost her. No. Uh, so we, we, why don't we wait till she comes back, but you can uh, maybe go ahead. Did someone else had a hand up? Was it Kara? Yeah, um, echoing what Haley said, I'd also say um, a lot of times they come with that talk they've given everywhere. And yep. what we try to do is we try to get down to the core at TEDx into it and the essence of what that talk's really about. And a great example from this year's show is we had an architect who was one of the 30 up and coming you know, people in San Diego. And he started talking about like architectural history and theory, and we're like, "That's great! Tell us about a time, you know, that that architecture made a difference to you." And he starts talking about this story about he went out to this Indian reservation and the church had burned down on the reservation, and how he learned with talking through uh, the people on the reservation what the church actually meant to the community, and and that really changed 180 the way he rebuilt and redesigned the church, and that was the talk he ended up giving us, was about the community and the Native Americans and the architecture as community, architecture as rebuilding, architecture as a central place for gathering. Um, and that was probably one of the highest rated talks from, from this year's show. So really getting to the core of, of um, what's meaningful with the speakers so that that comes through when they talk. Oh, I really want to, is that up yet? Um, no, I'm a I'm a corporate one, so ours oh, don't yes. get posted. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, it sounds wonderful. <laughs> um, let's see. Was um, Gordon? Hi. Um, so I've attended about 50 TEDx events now in the last four years. Um, TEDx Berkeley yesterday, and an observation is that. Academics tend to want to come and give a. Uh, I'm sorry about my parrot in the background. Academics, oh. <laughs> academics like to like to come and give a short version of one of their regular lectures rather than give a TED talk. Yeah, I know. I I just saw that yesterday. I went to TEDx Temple, um, which is which was great. Um, student run, tons of students in the audience. And there were a couple of professors that I, you could tell they were giving a 50 minute class in 18 minutes. Um, and one of them was enough of a star. And the people putting on the show were, you know, young enough that I think they didn't want to stop them. Um, and it was tough because if somebody had said to him, half that talk, I would have taken it. You know, I was like, ugh. Um, but you know, it is a, it's a it's a commitment. You know, asking these speakers to rethink their talk, to change up their slides, to re-memorize. You know, um, and so one thing I you know I want to take away from what Phil was saying earlier is you know that it is this sort of cliff that you know a talk that leaps off the TEDx YouTube page onto TED.com really can change careers. Um, but it's yeah, it's hard. Like, how do you how do you find the hook to get somebody to to get that? Um, do we get Haley back? Oh no, not yet. There, there 
there was also a speaker at TEDx Monterey last weekend, uh, exact same issue, where he went overtime and he had great material and a great story to tell, and I really wish he had spent the time to learn about the TED format and adapted what he had to say to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, what can we give you guys? Like, what can TED give organizers, um, like, as the sweetener, as the nudge, you know? Because it is, it's, it's a hard thing to come to someone and say, great talk, I need you to spend 40 more hours on it. Um, but then you might be the next Brene Brown, you know, get a book deal. Like, how do we... How do we say that in a in a practical way to speakers? You could share that you know. some of those stories. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, it's a it's a funny thing that we have to do as organizers because we certainly can't sell the promise that oh you're going to get on TED.com. That's definitely yeah. not a good idea. Uh, but even to say that there's a possibility that you're getting on is a significant incentive. Um, but even without that, I know that there are stories of uh, people who have spoken at my TEDx event. People who've had you know talks that have only had let's say ten to twenty or thirty thousand. Well, you know at the time when this happened, the talk only had like two thousand views. The person was often a na offered a national public uh, radio show, you know. Amazing. And uh, we've had other speakers. I mean, I'm sure all of you who have done this these events for more than a couple years know that there are amazing opportunities and doors that can open locally, regionally, nationally because the speaker has an outstanding you know, representation of their work. Um, one of the challenges I have is, is navigating the difference between trying to get a speaker to do the best talk. This is going to hurt a little bit for me to say. Mm -hmm. Pr trying to get someone to do the best talk that's for them, the best talk, versus a talk that belongs most on TED.com. right? Because it really does need to hit a different kind of note uh, to get on TED.com from my own, you know, perception, and it's, you know, haphazard, and there are plenty of things that, you know, I don't know about that, you know, that go into what gets on and what doesn't, um, but there are some tough edges uh, there uh, in, in coaching a speaker uh, when I'm just like, yes, you know, you're doing this for you, and, or you're doing this for this mission-based objective that you have, um, in fact, actually, that's a question to you, Emily, is when do you, you know, know that a speaker is doing something kind of for their own purpose? And, and Leslie Morgensteiner is a really good example for me. I mean, you probably know that talk a little bit uh, because she was, in a sense, working through her own therapeutic experience from having it been in a domestic violence situation. And it was, and I kind of felt like I, you know, was tempted on the one hand to say really, you know, you're not trying to get the audience to re-experience what you had. Instead, but you do want them to have a strong experience of what's meaningful and important. Do you have any thoughts about that kind of a case where there's a there's some ad being at odds between what the speaker wants and what you think is best for the talk? I, I see some nodding down here. Do other people have stories, like similar stories or experiences? Tara? It's, it's interesting. I, I joined this talk because, um, or this session, because I wanted to hear kind of the challenges people were facing. But as a corporate TEDx event, none of my talks aren't even ever going to go on the YouTube channel. So I, I don't know. I kind of want to encourage other TEDx organizers to say, don't even worry about how to get your talks on TEDx.com or TED.com. Just concentrate on getting the best talk out of somebody that you can because as, as somebody whose talks will never be seen, um, it's so not a worry for me. I'm just trying to make sure I can coach them to get them um, the best talk I can out of them. So that's just another perspective for because I, I hear it a lot from my friends who are organizers like, oh, how do I get it on TED? How do I get on TED? And I'm like, I don't know because I can't. So just concentrate on the talk and the speaker. Can I tell you, my? I think some of you know my secret, which is that I was an organizer at TEDx Philly. We've had two day-long events, never had a talk on TED.com. Um, and we go in knowing that, you know, that it's all about Philly. Um, and so, I feel you. Jenny? Um, I, I, I sort of wanted to echo what Carol, Carol was saying. Um, I wanted to join this uh, hangout because I 
basically want our talks to be really excellent. But mm -hmm. I don't worry about getting them on TED.com. Um, when, as I said, we're on our fourth one now, and you know, I I never feel like I really have it down. <laughs> um, when I at this point, when I am recruiting speakers, the number one criteria I have is how motivated are they? Um, like, I don't care so much about their credentials. I think that probably almost everyone has an idea worth spreading. But if they have to be willing to work their asses off. And that's really all I care about. Um, the number one worst experience we had was also the number one worst, I mean, most well-known person. Like we, last year we had someone who was kind of a bit of a superstar and we were not even able to post this talk online because um, he was so sure of himself and so arrogant that um, it was unusable. He, um, he, he kind of got into some bad science-y type stuff. Um, not like as David Weber put it, not bad science, but not good science either, because he started pulling from areas that were outside his areas of expertise. Mm. And he also used about three copyrighted images that we just simply couldn't put up. And so, you know, like, I didn't, I mean, actually didn't need to start griping about this. I could gripe about it for like five hours straight. But, um, you know, it. I I just wanted to say that, you know, for me the most important thing is how motivated the person is, and not their credentials. Totally. Yeah. So anyway, that's uh, obviously I'm a little bit pent up about it. <laughs> <laughs> we usually tell speak that if he move on more than 18 minutes then his book won't be posted um, on the on YouTube. That kind of make them um, limit to 18 minutes. So oh, that's so smart. We also use it to scare them. Uh, we tell them that if the, uh, if the talk is longer than 18 minutes it won't have any chance to get on chat.com. But the truth, is, the truth is, uh, there is only one uh, talking Spanish from. from <laughs> there is only one Spanish uh, talk from TEDx event in Mexico, DC. Mm -hmm. uh, the F. Um, and I want to know what were your, uh, your thoughts about that. Uh, yeah. Uh, how come we make uh, Spanish or any other language uh, uh, talks better or TED worthy? I, I think um, David Weber's been working on this. Um, he's got that a group of people screening the original talks in Spanish. Um, it is it's it's difficult for us because our editors um, we have one that speaks French. I think one speaks Korean. Um, you know, to find somebody who can edit in Spanish for us is a trick. Um, but that really is what's holding us up is just little procedure stuff. Um, I think that David's group that he started to put together last year after the summit um, has been screening a bunch of great talks. Um, yeah, the, we've the, been screening a lot, a long list of talks, especially one of the Arabic pre uh, review team. And it's been a long list, but still no talks have been posted on TED for me yet, and I've been asking a lot about that. Uh, yeah. When they launched the Arabic version of TED, it would be an Arabic. Talk yeah, we have some Arabic TED. talks in the pipeline. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, we have some Arabic talks in our pipeline right now. I can add. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. So, Emily, by the way, my name is Sarge. Uh, at TED Active, I really enjoyed the time you spent with us down in Long Beach, telling us about what you go through and how we can, you know, help you uh, bring uh, better speakers. I think that was really cool. Okay, uh, thank you. 
I did just email. I was at TEDx Penn State, and there were two absolutely awesome talks that I emailed to David. And a week later, I think, I heard back from Asia, who very politely declined. And I said, oh, no problem. Um, I understand. Uh, I, I don't want to get in the business of trying to guess what you, how you guys are going to pick them. Ah, and, uh, yeah. But uh, it's, it's one of those things. I don't try to bring it up with the speakers, because if the second they bring up TED, I start questioning their motivation. You know? Yeah. Uh, but you know, it, it is what it is. I, I don't know how you guys manage. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. But I really appreciate the, the feedback you gave us about, you know, especially on the audio and, and, and so forth. Yeah, the audio is a big deal. And I, I saw that actually yesterday. I, I was at TEDx Temple U. Um, they had a couple guys who had the, the lav mic. Yeah. But they didn't tell the speaker not to hit their chest. <laughs> <laughs> It's so tough, you know. It's just like these sort of very small things. Um, we actually we have a speaker coming up for TED Global, um, Dambisa Moyo, who has very long hair. I don't know if you know what she looks like. She has this mm -hmm. very long, beautiful head of hair. Yeah. And we're like, okay, how are we gonna mic her? Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want to wear this, but we yeah. have to get that good sound. Um, it's the yeah. hardest thing, the sound, and then um, yeah. It's funny. I don't know how many of you noticed. Um, so I gave the talk on Monday at Long Beach. It was like, you know, the, the, the thing that people hate, detest, can't stand is, you know, reading your notes off your iPhone. And then, I remember that, yeah. And then didn't Rich and Tone Rich read their talks off their iPhones? You know, I'm just like, ugh. <laughs> But, but you know, I mean, I've had speakers uh, at TEDx Baltimore actually read off a piece of paper because, you know what, if you don't watch and listen, it's beautifully delivered. Yeah. You know, and it helps, but it just you don't get that glow, glow effect. Yeah. It is. It's the glow, and there's just something about, you know, if I get my phone out now and you're just like, what is she doing? She's on the phone with me. It's, yeah. it's and then you get maybe you have email or like a Facebook thing. Or, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like, whoa, Vine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know why the feeling from reading from an electronic device is so much worse than reading from a piece of paper. Uh, yeah. it, it is. It is. <laughs> That's the funniest thing. I just it, it, people just get furious. Um, it's irrational. Um, but the sound thing actually is worth coming back to because I, I think it's something that you guys all you know. Every show is different. Every sound guy is different. Um, have you guys thought about sound? Do, are there tricks or tips that you can share with the group about getting good sound? Uh, I know most recently at Baltimore, we rented uh, those, you know, the ones that were called Lavalier, and that was like, they're not that expensive. I think it was like $30 a day each, and they come in different skin tones too, by the way. <laughs> oh, that but, is uh, I yeah. think you're talking about the Countryman. The, the Countryman. Yes, man. yes, yes. Yes. The lavaliers are the ones that are, uh, you know, that clip on like this. Okay, no, and those no, yeah, are here. adequate. But the ones with the boom tend to have higher quality, or I don't. I mean, I don't. I I, I bet there's a quality range there too. Um, you know what I, I heard a great tip with the lav mic actually um, is to get two, so that the speaker can turn left or turn right, and you still get that sound like it's coming out of their mouth. Interesting. Do you guys uh, do stereo? Is stereo recording of voice part of the deal? If it's a music performance, I understand that, but I don't know about non-music. It's just one track. Yeah, yeah. With 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 music, yeah, we do a Pro Tool session and the whole nine yards. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's just voice. And then you know, you have most cameras will have their own mic, and um, certainly you want all of those on and recording at the same time. And some. Um, Video producers will say, "Oh, well, we got one mic with it on. What, why do we need the mics on on the other ones?" Well, it sounds different in each part of the room. Um, so uh, you cat, you get, you know, you may want to change the amount of sound that you get from different parts of the room when you're doing your video editing. Um, I know some places will do a, you know, like an additional mic that's just on the floor or someone else out, which can catch sound if you have a fail or in certain cases that will work? I don't know. Anybody else? Yeah. yeah it's funny. It's, it's, it's so hard. It, it, the event I went to yesterday, there were a couple of people with just the folding mics. And if you're comfortable with it, it's great. You know, if your speaker can rock it, 
you know, and kind of be in the moment. Um, but it is funny because it's just, you know, it's either it's either good or bad. I mean, that was actually our, one of our closest calls with TEDx Philly. We had a talk from Chris Lehman, the principal, and it was our kickoff talk, first talk of the ev event ever. People are crying, and he has a mic fail. Um, and we lost 20 seconds of the talk, and he went back in, he looped it, it never matched. Oh, it was a heartbreaker, you know? And looping doesn't work, by the way. Everybody will come back and say, oh, I want to, you know, I'll re-record this part of the talk. And, um, yeah, I don't know if you've had speakers offer to do that. No, just uh, people who want to edit out, oh, uh, you know, like where I edit out ums and ahs or stuff like that. Yeah, editing out is easy. Editing in. Yeah. Yeah. Is there if there's a fail like five minutes into the talk, is the protocol to like start over? Um, it depends. I mean, if you can, you'll know the talk well enough at that point. You know, start at a good point to get a clean edit. Um, okay. But it's funny because like the audience will put up with that like once or twice, and then they start to feel like, you know, am I? on a movie set, you know, like, is this take five? So, you know, it's, it's, a funny, uh, it's a funny balancing act. And at a certain point, the host probably should come out and just go, you know, thank you guys, really, really appreciate it. You know, making sure that the speaker doesn't have to navigate. Um, when we had, we had one um, in 2009, uh, David Merrill, who did those little siftables cubes, um, gets through half his talk and his slides just stop working. Just stop. And, you know, he's a grad student, he's kind of freaking out, and Chris came on stage and was just like, you know what, we'll sort you out, we're going to put the next speaker on, get your slides fixed, and then you come back in, and he did the second half of the talk, and it edited together, you can't tell. Hmm. Okay. Um, Emily, I, just a, a thought here, we've probably got uh, another 15 or 20 minutes. Great. Um, and I just tooled through your slides, and... I know a couple of us were at your session, but I'm realizing that there's both a video audience and a post-event audience that won't get a chance to hear those ideas uh, gotcha. unless you do that uh, difficult thing, perhaps, of going and making points you've made perhaps many times before. Oh, it's um, my pleasure. Um, yeah. You... I don't know how others feel. Is it all right if, if we, she tries to go through those? Yeah, Gordon's a thumbs up, multiple thumbs up. All right, I'm going to go ahead and screen share. And um, uh, why don't you just cue me on next slide and just go next, okay, Emily? Love it. Oh, this will be fun. All right, where is now? Go. Action. Woo! <laughs> We're going to get there. Uh, where are the hackers? It's amazing, by the way, whatever's happening right now. There we okay, go. Hang on a sec, I'm going to go back to the beginning. I, like, got incepted. What's happening here? Sorry. Uh, no, 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 take your time. Emily, welcome to TEDx to the TEDx uh, Hangout stage. <laughs> I, I love this. <laughs> this is fun. So, how, have you guys been like doing this all day? Like, yeah, yeah. We call it controlled spontaneity, <laughs> and and you know, it's like a little bit of mix. And we're doing everything that you don't do. We have had no rehearsals at all for this. <laughs> we have done no. Preparation. Um, we're keeping it loose, keeping it light, keeping it lively. And um, yeah, welcome to our wild world. I so anyway, you want to just uh, run through the slides, or, or fantastic? Yeah, I'll I'll go through. Um, we can whip through these first very quickly. You know my first one. I love posting TEDx talks on TED.com. Um, and so this was um, at the end of February. We had. 1,446 talks on TED.com, and of those, 246 were TEDx talks. So if you want to whip forward to that, um, and obviously that's a really impressive number. It's one in six. I'm looking at my math. Um, and the ratio is almost one-to-one -one talks from TED.com and from TEDx talks being added each month, at least for the last month or two. Definitely. Um, and, you know, obviously it goes up and down because, mm -hmm. you know, right after a conference we have tons and tons of content from TED 2013. Um, but 
you know, November, December comes around, and we run out of talks from conferences, um, which we won't actually this year. Um, we're making a better plan. But we get so enthusiastic after a TED, we're just like, we have to put it all up now. Um, and so then we really need those TEDx talks. We really need those wonderful talks from other events um, to fill out the schedule because people expect one talk every day that's just going to make them drop everything and think something brand new. Um, so yeah, if you want to flip forward, yeah, one in six talks total on TED.com from home from the TEDx. And that's out of 25,000. Um, now I think 26,000. Yeah, I think Laura said 28,000. It's unbelievable okay. how fast the numbers are growing. It's amazing to me. Um, and we're, well, I'll, I'll get to this. Um, so yeah, from, you know, 25,000, the, the math is neater at 25,000 um, with 246 chosen. If you want to flip forward, the, the math is about 1 in 100, um, which is actually kind of amazing. You know, if you think that um, a TEDx event exists for a community, it exists for a live community of people, it exists for a room, um, and you know that this sort of funny little side effect happens. Um, one in a hundred actually feels like kind of a lot. Um, so that says one in a hundred. If you want to flip ahead, um, what am I looking for? Uh, this is like this is going to be like the Larry Lessig slide experience. Uh, flip ahead, please. <laughs> um, yeah, you can do. You can go through these next five. Um, Ali Karshelman, TEDx uh, Penn State. Um, new research. We're pulling a lot of talks right now from TEDx Caltech um, from new research. Creativity, flip ahead again. Um, there's Dan Phillips um, making houses out of reclaimed stuff. I actually found this guy through Jamil Abu Warde, um, who's a former TED speaker. He posted this on his homepage when it had like. 200 views this talk. He's like, this is great. You're going to love this guy. And I was like, yeah. Um, flip ahead again. Um, Brene Brown, obviously the iconic talk from a TEDx. Um, I think she's gone on to have 5 million views. And the, the important thing to know about Brene Brown's talk, technically, um, is that I was worried when we posted it because it already had 80,000 views on the TEDx YouTube channel. I was really worried that we would lose those views on TED.com. Um, and what Brene and some others proved is that what happens instead is we do, you know, that many views times 10. Um, we're not, TEDx YouTube channel doesn't cannibalize TED. Um, so that if you were holding back a talk that has like a lot of views because you're worried that it's not going to get any more views um, on TED.com, it almost always does. Um, if you want to flip ahead, um, let's see. Well, Dave Meslin from TEDx Toronto. This is another really great um, global talk with a local focus. Um, it worked in the room. It worked for his audience of Toronto people. But the message was really global. Um, if you want to flip ahead, and the, these guys all have four things in common. They're confident. Um, they're well prepared either by themselves or by the organizer. They're authentic, and this is really important. They're presenting their own research. They're presenting experiences that they've had. They're not presenting someone else's story. They're not presenting someone else's data. They're telling their own story. Um, and so what they're saying rings true. Um, and then speaking to an audience, which is the uh, thing that I talked about a little bit, um, which is where you come in as as the host. Um, if you want to flip two ahead, Phil, um, why do people love a great TED, TED Talk? Because the speaker cares that the audience understands. Um, this is so important. This is why TEDx and TED Talks connect. Not because they're interesting, not because they're flashy, but because there's one person standing on a stage talking to you, really, really wanting you to understand it. And the people who watch that feel honored, you know, feel respected. Um, it's really, really moving to hear people react to TED Talks that way. Um, and sometimes it's hard for a speaker to get to that point if they're used to talking to a piece of paper, you know. Um, talking to you and 
practicing talking to you is a really important part of the process. Um, and so you can flip forward a bit, Phil, um, and flip again, um, flip again, and flip one more time. Um, and so these are three questions that you can ask your speakers. Are they talking to you or at you? Um, are they watching you to see how you react? Um, can you follow the information in the order it's presented? And that's really interesting to me because it's like some people will just jump right in. You know, they'll jump into their data and you need to tell someone, fight the fear of seeming uneducated. Um, you know, you need to tell your speaker, I need to know more background. I need to know more basics. Um, do you need context? Do you need backstory? Or is the speaker starting with 10 minutes of context and backstory and you're just like, we all know. We all know that global warming is bad. Um, you, know, you can skip that part. <laughs> it's sort of a classic. If you want to skip ahead, um, you're a partner in making a great TEDx talk. Um, next slide, please. This is, yeah, opening the kimono a bit, which I think is really important. Um, how does TED.com plan our weekly schedule? Um, you can skip ahead. Sophisticated technology. Next slide. We invented these. We invented post-its. Um, and um, if you want to skip one more ahead, um, we have five days and five themes, and you can just bomb through these. So, um, Big idea Monday. Yep. Tech Design Tuesday, Storyteller Wednesday, Science Thursday, Entertainment Friday. Has everybody watched this guy, by the way, Geert Chatru? Mm -hmm. I have not. It's it's a whistleblower you haven't seen. Is it the nose whistleblower? No, he it's a regular kind of. Do we have a nose whistleblower? <laughs> not yet. I guess there's still more to be done. But yeah. Come on, you guys. Tell Emily, <clears throat> Emily, we got we just got a we got a whistler for TEDx Mid Atlantic in October. Oh, amazing! And you know what? How we found him? He no. was the he was the the body man for one of our speakers, David Rubenstein of the Carlisle Group. <laughs> He's managing director of like communication. He gives me his card, and I Google him. I was like, dude, if you had told me, we'd thrown you on stage. So <laughs> anyway, he's, we're bringing him in October. <laughs> And I tell you what, I want him to do a duet with Reggie Watts, but that's still in the. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but we're working on that. But yeah, we have a Whistler in October. Oh, I'm I'm dying. I'm there. When is oh, when is TEDx in Atlantic this year? Uh, it's uh, 25 and 26. The well, last weekend in October, Friday, Saturday. Was someone else talking? Oh, okay. So Entertainment Friday. We're gonna flip ahead. Um, and then this is just our, our real basic process, um, how we find the talks. We want to flip next slide. Um, first review, and that's paid interns. Um, and that's important that it's paid interns. It's not just you know people off the street. These are people that you know Weber and I vet for experience in subject areas um, and experience watching and commenting on video. Um, so we really trust what they have to say. Um, and, and they're smart and lovely. Um, and then if you flip one more. Um, and our group review is what I do with my, my editors. Um, we work from a spreadsheet that David Weber puts together. And um, yeah, at least two people have to sign off on a talk um, and like it and have substantive comments, you know, and make the case. Why is this talk different from a talk we have before? Why is this the talk on this topic? Um, and then if you want to, next slide. Is, is the spreadsheet you work with David Weber from a list of the talks, or is it a list of criteria for evaluating them? Um, it's a list of the talks, but we've, we've all sort of thought about the criteria a lot. Um, and then the final OK from the media team, and that's either me, June, Bruno, Chris, um, you know, a couple of the sort of higher-ups at TED also have to sign off on the talk and love it, um, mm -hmm. because we all have to love it. Um, and so, you know, next slide, and I'm just going to say this, it seems like kind of rigmarole, but throwing a TEDx is a lot of work, and we are constantly impressed and awed by what you do. 
Um, just know that there's a meeting, a 90-minute meeting every week at the TED office where we just sit and watch TED Talks and mm -hmm. talk about it. Um, and a table full of smart, smart young people who do nothing but that all week long. Um, you know, we love you guys. We pay attention to what you do. Um, if you want to flip one more. Um, oh, yeah. All right, Phil, I'm going to let you drive this next couple of slides. Um, there's a lot of stuff on them. These are the 36 reasons. Um, do you want to go ahead and flip ahead? Okay. Do you want me to just yeah. read through this real quick? or? Um, yeah. I, and, and, you know, let's check in about halfway through if we're... Okay. The talk <laughs> lacks a structure that would help viewers remember the concepts in detail. It might be too UK centric or local centric, I'm guessing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a speaker has a tendency to wander off from his or her main idea and adds all kinds of details, sub ideas, and facts that are distracting from the point and weaken the talk. Um, although the stories are compelling, mm, I don't think there was a strong enough central idea that would make this a TED talk. Um, the central idea isn't explored deeply enough, right? So depth, um, a bit of a hack. In other words, the person doesn't have sufficient expertise or, you know, uh, experience to, of mastery. It's interesting work, but the talk itself is very dull. Ugh. Yeah. Uh, the shelf life is too short. Uh, it's re with referencing many very specific recent events without being particularly pressing. The ideas, though expressed well, are not particularly new. Newness is really important to you, isn't it? Um, it depends. Um, I mean, a new idea in a field that's bursting with new ideas is important. Um, but... I don't know. There's something about a talk that doesn't feel fresh. Um, I'm going to think of a way to... Let's do some more while I think about what, what I mean there. <laughs> uh, it's, an, it's an important issue, but it's not presented in a way that delivers an aha moment. So it's an important issue without the aha, without realization or breakthrough or... How you can be part of it. Yeah, how you can solve or be part of solving it. Nice. Uh, yeah, or engage you, hook you in. Mm -hmm. um, it's more of a history lesson with perspective than an idea talk per se. So having a historic strength but uh, and a vision, but not necessarily uh, uh, being a TED talk or an idea talk. Um, it wasn't really framed as an idea until the end and didn't really hold together as an idea talk. It was more of an informative rundown. I liked this little talk, but have a feeling it will come off as lightweight. Hmm. I found this talk to be scientifically reckless. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, scientifically re reference scientifically reckless meaning code for uh, make playing with the facts or you know uh, yes, it's solid science. I'm sure of it. Uh, we have we have confidence in this data, even though there are only two experiments that have ever been done and twenty conflicting ones that I'm not going to happen to mention. Uh, yeah, I mean, something that we do think about is um, is this the kind of talk if someone listens to it at seventy five percent attention, it will lead them to take an action that isn't very smart. Um, and you know, as an example, just as a hypothetical, you could say, you know, is this a talk that would cause someone to not have their child treated for a disease? Um, you know, is this a talk that would lead to some, a poor decision, um, you know, for someone's health, for someone's well-being, um, if it wasn't, because we do have some talks where people, they split hairs a little bit. You know, they're like, this is, you know, we have a really small sample size, but this is what we're finding. And we do judge that kind of talk against the general audience's ability to understand that what might have worked in a sample size of three people may not work for them or their child. Um, you know, we do feel a sense of responsibility there. 
I mean, it's a, it's a real claim that when, you know, the, the purpose of a TED Talk is to, you know, uh, proclaim the power of this idea, which, you know, may largely be potential, but it, we're also trying to establish the reality of that potential. And yeah. so in a talk that involves science, that might mean sort of reaching a little bit. What's the line between reaching and overreaching? Um, I think, like I said, um, the, the main thing that we look for is um, if somebody misinterprets this talk, will it harm them personally? Um, you know, will it lead to a bad health decision, a bad other kind of decision? Um, you know, if we had a TED Talk, well, like Stephen Levitt's talk about not putting your kid in a um, car seat. Um, you know, he was saying something kind of whizzy and fun at the time, very Freakonomics-y, you know, that putting your kid in the car seat has a certain outcome, not doing it has a certain other outcome. But and at the end of the talk, he, he comes out and says, no, you should put your kid in a car seat. <laughs> you so know? you can address this by uh, working with your speaker to make sure that they provide the necessary caveats or, you know, uh, like, uh, manage the fact value aspect there, right? That, you know, this is still very preliminary. We don't have any, you know, concrete results here, but things look to be um, suggesting that there, it may be in 10 years, we'll think that consciousness is, uh, you know, something that is related to a quantum magnetic field. Maybe, yeah. But qualifying it. Okay. Should I go on? Uh, this is a personal story which doesn't stand alone as a TED talk. Hmm, a lot of those. Yeah. He or she doesn't manage to graft the story onto another strong message or idea. It is a story for story's sake. Uh-huh. Uh, he gets to his point, but not until the last 15 seconds. Ouch. It's Coaching so error. Um, a good, interesting talk, but it doesn't feel as new for us. And that's, you know, I think I mentioned this in, in other talks. Like, if you have a talk about how to tie your shoes, um, I, I'm sorry. You know, like, I bet it's amazing, but we already have a talk about how to tie your shoes. You know, it's sort of like that, um, thinking in terms of the whole Ted Cannon um, you know, we might have had a talk that got there first. Emily, I have a quick question, if you don't mind. Yeah. So, going through the stuff, I mean, you know, a, a shitty talk is really blatantly obvious, you know. But yeah. have you ever seen a talk and felt that if the organi the TEDx organizer had done a little bit more coaching or helped them more, it could have been awesome? Or what do you think? Yeah, and I think there's definitely some, you know, sort of in this list where, um, you know, if... Um, yeah, if somebody had just said, you know, keep your hands off your nose, um, you know, or look up, um, or, you know, just really, really basic little things. Um, but others, yeah, you know, coaching errors like, you know, try not to do a duo talk. Um, those are really, really hard to pull off. Can one of you, you know, can you pick one person in your group to present? Um, or going over their slides. Um, would be another thing. So, yeah. Um, do we want to sort of whip through the rest of these? The slides are all online. If we can just put the link into the YouTube, because um, I, I definitely want to. I see we have about ten more to go. Um, okay. And um, I'm just gonna do the first two words. Not sure the audio is salvageable. Uh, <laughs> drinking game. Uh, <laughs> convinced. Uh, delivery captivating, but nothing new or profound. Idealistic, unfocused, too much like a sales pitch. If only the video quality were better. Yeah, the sales pitch is actually something you can listen for in rehearsal and and work with the speaker to pull mm -hmm. out. No logos on the screen. Um, the orient the organization is bad. Uh, beginning is shaky when the quotes are being read, etc. Not you know, and then we've got strong conclusion, but is needed. Uh, phrases that are over repeated. Yeah. Um, trying to imitate another talk. Yeah. Um, speaking to an audience that's too uh, sheltered and affluent. Um, this presenter too good talk in them, but could have been presented more thoughtfully. Um, 
it's sort of a yay, rah, rah, teach passion, blah, blah. Uh, decent info uh, that follows the TED format. Um, and it's firing, but it's, it's trying too much, but it's awkward, unnatural. And lecture speak, the professor's bane. Oh, my, there's more. Uh, oh, there's some more. We can whip through. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Next thing, we should collaborate. Um, we should take in a deep dive. Talk for ten minutes. Pause. It's one idea. Could have done in much less. And here's is this and and don't you should follow the speaker guide. This is a different place. This is not the slide, but um, valuable. And then yes, you've seen the silly, silly reasons we've talked about. Unfixable these. audio and you read notes off an iPad. That's bad. Oh. But yeah, TEDx matters. Um, and the next slide is just me. Uh, this is a note I wrote to Chris and Lara um, after Toledo TEDx Toledo. Um, and I have to say, like, this is the first TEDx in my hometown. TEDx has been around for three years. Nobody had just even bothered um, up to this point. And then Will Lucas um, put together a group and changed what people thought about my hometown in a way that was incredibly moving. It, um, it is amazing how you can have real powerful local change. Yeah. I don't know that those stories have widely gotten spread within the TEDx organizer community. That would be great. To know more about, I think. Noah, were you? Did you have your hand up? Oh. Uh, Haley Foster has her hand up. Yes. Hi there. It's been very frustrating to be kicked off so many times. Oh, I have a question. Do you think that speakers are being in in danger of being overcoached? Um, I think there's a. It's funny, like. That's a term I hear, overcoached. Um, and I think there's definitely a danger of being too teddy. 